May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. On the 1st of May, 1517, I'm sure none of you remember it, um, Sir Thomas Moore uh, confronted a, a mob in London who were actually trying to uh, kill and, uh, or at least throw out immigrants. It became known as Ill May Day. And uh, a fairly well-known playwriter uh, called William Shakespeare um, wrote what he imagined uh, Thomas Moore had, had said that day as he tried to calm the crowd down and make them think about what they were doing. Grant them removed, and grant that this your noise hath chid down all the majesty of England. Imagine that you see the wretched strangers, their babies at their backs, and their poor luggage plodding to the ports and coasts for transportation. And that you sit as kings in your desires, authority quite silenced by your brawl. And you in rough of your opinions clothed, what had you got, I tell you? You had taught how insolence and strong hands should prevail, how order should be quelled, and by this pattern not one of you should live an aged man. For other ruffians, as their fancies wrought with self-same hand, self-reason and self-right, would shark on you, and men like ravenous fishes feed on one another. Alas, alas, say now the king, as he is clement, if the offender mourn, should so much come too short of your great trespass, as but to banish you, whither would you go? What country, by the nature of your error, should give you harbour? Go you to France or Flanders? To any German province? To Spain or to Portugal? Nay, anywhere that not adheres to England? Why, you must needs be strangers. Would you be pleased to find a nation of such barbarous temper that breaking out in hideous violence would not afford you an abode on earth, wet their detested knives against your throats, spurn you like dogs, and like as if that God owned not nor made not you? Nor that the elements were not all appropriate to your comforts, but chartered unto them, what would you think to be thus used? This is the stranger's case, and this your mountainish inhumanity. Sometimes we think of times past, and people in times past as much more barbarous than us, but there were certainly some who saw the reality of what people tried to do to others. It's Palm Sunday. Jesus is coming into Jerusalem. Uh, the people are very happy. The disciples are a bit confused because he, some of them have been sent to get a coat uh, from a man they don't know in a place they don't know and are worried. Are they going to get told off and maybe arrested for nicking at the coat? And all sorts of stuff's going on. And uh, Jesus is processing, I suppose is the best way to talk about it, um, and he's going through Jericho on the way up, and it is the way up to Jerusalem. And as he passes through, there is a man who hears what's going on, only hears what's going on because um, he can't see, he's blind. And this man begins to shout, begins to make a fuss, begins to make a noise because he hears that Jesus is coming. Bartimaeus was his name. Uh, most of us probably, if we went to Sunday school in our earliest days, will have heard the story of blind Bartimaeus. I think there's even a song that has in it somewhere leap, leaping and jumping and praising God, which is what he did once he'd been healed. Oh, sorry, I've, got, I've done a spoiler. Um, but... He sits at the city gate and he depends on all the people around him. 
uh, for charity, for alms. But when he hears that Jesus is coming, it's like his whole personality changes. And this quiet man who would have sat, maybe just you know, saying a few words as people went past, trying not to annoy them, because if you annoy people, they don't give you the money that you need to make your living. And Jesus is coming. And he begins to shout. He begins to make a nuisance of himself. He begins to um, shout and shout and shout. This man who'd possibly be ignored by many people because if the man's blind, he can't see who it is who's not giving him money as they pass by. As long as you stay quiet as you walk past, no one knows. And the man won't know whether the coin that you're dropping in is valuable or not. But he begins to shout. He wasn't to know it, but this was the last time that Jesus would pass through Jericho. He was on his way to that procession, to what we now call Holy Week and his death. But something prompted him. How did he know who Jesus was? Well, it's funny when you're sitting on the ground waiting for people to give you money and as they stand there perhaps um, it's very easy to be unseen and unknown ignored by all the people around him he would have heard the talk he would have known who this man was and now he hears he's coming through again and Bartimaeus is desperate As a blind man, he can't do anything but beg, and he doesn't want to. And so he starts to shout. And what does he shout? Well, he shouts, son of David, uh, which basically meant ancestor of David. But it's more than just that, that Jesus was an ancestor of David. It was a title given to the one who is expected to be the Messiah. It had a resonance with people. Uh, like certain phrases in certain parts of the world, have a resonance. You sort of say certain things like, in Northern Ireland, well it's a question rather than a saying, but in Northern Ireland when you meet someone, um, and you know you have the pl usual pleasantries, you meet them in some sort of neutral place, you'll get asked things like, what's your name? Well that seems innocuous enough. Um, what you do? We all ask that. And where you went to school? Because where you went to school, on the whole, tells people whether you're a Protestant or a Catholic, whether you're a Unionist or a Republican, on what side you are of the great divide. And so as an English person going into that and asked where you went to school, if you told them, oh, you know, I went to whatever school in England, they're not interested, they'll have to ask you more questions because that tells them nothing. Whereas in Ireland, in Northern Ireland, people will know from the school you went to. Though I'd be confusing because I went to one of the few schools at the time that had Protestants and Catholics in it and that confused the life out of everybody. Uh, Lima Valley Grammar. But he's shouting this, son of David. He knows that here is someone special. He knows that here is someone who's, who's been talked about as the Messiah. Perhaps he'd made his mind up sitting in the dirt day after day, that if this man came back, this man he'd been hearing about, he wanted to meet him. We don't know how long he'd been waiting. We don't know long, how long he'd been thinking. But he wanted someone to do something for him. He wanted someone who would make a difference to him. How many people there are like that in our world? ignored, cast aside, not just refugees, people who don't feel like anyone cares, to feel, who feel unloved and uncared for. And yet when they or others on their behalf make a fuss, they're thought to be troublemakers. They're thought to be people who should keep their mouths shut, could should know their place in society. 
Well, Bartimaeus wasn't going to shut up. Bartimaeus wasn't going to keep quiet. And he kept shouting even when people told him not to. The people his living depended upon told him not to. He kept on shouting. We'll think about those people in a minute, but because he kept on shouting, Jesus heard him and Jesus said, bring him to me. And well, they didn't really want to, but when the teacher says, bring him here, they, they thought, well, we will. And so they bring him to Jesus. And Jesus, well, he was always asking questions, wasn't he? But he asks a really strange question. He says, um, as he stands before him, he says, what do you want me to do for you? <laughs> and I can imagine, and it's just my imagination, but I can imagine with people in the crowd going, doesn't he know he's blind? <laughs> doesn't he understand? Oh, but he knew. But he wanted to know from him. And he says something very interesting. He says, my teacher, let me see again. He was a man who knew what it was to have sight, to see, and had lost it. Desperate. And Jesus says, go, your faith has made you well. And immediately he could see. Immediately all that he'd lost, all that um, he'd mourned over, over perhaps many years had gone. And it, everything was back to normal. Jesus said, you know, you can go now, that's fine. Except he doesn't. I suppose it's not a surprise really, although some, when Jesus healed them, just went off their own merry way. But, but Bartimaeus followed him up the road from Jericho to Jerusalem. He saw the throne pan leaves and the cloaks lay on the ground, but he would see also the cross and perhaps the resurrection. Here's a man who'd found more than just his sight back. Here is a man who'd found someone he believed was the Messiah who would put things right. Whether we know it or not, each one of us knows people like him. Perhaps we've been and perhaps, perhaps we are like him. Do we see them? Do people see us? But most important of all, do we cry out? And are we desperate to find what Jesus wants to do for us? It was his desperation and his willingness to go against everyone else that led him, quite literally, to stand before Jesus. I wonder, are we that determined to know what God wants to be and to do in our lives? Well, that's part of Mace, a blind man who was determined. Well, there were other sorts of people too. There were the people who couldn't really care less, and, and, and as far as they were concerned, he was just getting in the way. They were there to see the Jews, see Jesus. They were there to hear about this, to hear this great preacher. Because remember, it's the days before TV, it's the days before newspapers, it's the days, even before radio, we've, we've been looking at the King's Speech, haven't we, as, as part of our Lent study, and, and, and some of his radio broadcasts, which were cutting edge at the time. Well, there was none of that. To see Jesus, you had to see Jesus. To hear Jesus, you had to be close enough to him. And he was coming through Jericho. And, and as they're trying to listen to him, and as they're trying to get through the crowd to see him, all they can hear is this noise at the back. Some of them wouldn't have known who he was. Others would have gone, oh, that's that Bartimaeus. He's usually all right, but he's making a right fuss today. I wish he'd shut up. I could imagine some of them saying, how dare Bartimaeus disrupt their lives? Have you ever felt like that as part of a church? Ever felt like that? Uh, we had um, at Shoebury, we had the, the blessing of um, some uh, babies being born. In fact, there's another one on the way. Uh, from, the, from the same sort of, um, well, from the, the same two people were the grandparents of, of, of all three children, not just four. 
And, um, well, babies make a noise, don't they? Babies uh, make strange noises. Babies make happy noises and baby, babies make unhappy noises. And I remember having conversations with some people. I mean, I had conversations with, with them and also some other folk who, who came occasionally with their child. Um, and my attitude was, you know, if, if they get to the point where they're screaming the house down, you know, where you can't even help yourself think, then perhaps you might want to think about taking them out. Um, and helping them just to calm down, because you'll not be very calm either. But if they're being happy, if they're making happy noises, then, then I'm fine with that. They're part of us. They're part of who we are. Sometimes they made happy noises at the most appropriate moments, and I was able to use it as part of the sermon. Sometimes it was very inappropriate happy times, but it, but it was fine. And there were a few who had a problem with it and talked to me about it. I said, oh, it must really put you off. And I used to say, no, the only children who ever put me off when I was preaching were my children because I felt responsible for them. Um, and the slightest noise could distract me. But it's not just children, is it? Sometimes when people are hurting, sometimes when people are finding life difficult, they cause a disturbance by the things they say and the way they are. And it's so easy to see it that people just making a fuss and why won't they stop? And that's how they were. There have been times down through the years when people have been much more accommodating, much more friendly, much more willing to accommodate people than they are today in society and I think sometimes in the church. At the moment it seems to me that there are those who in almost every country who, who don't want refugees, who don't want people who have been displaced, who don't want people fleeing from war, who don't want people who've risked their lives crossing seas to get to a place of safety out of desperation. It seems that particularly when Donald Trump was in charge in America, America was like that, but, but it wasn't always like that. As you go into New York, well, I've seen it on film, I've never been there. There's a large statue given by the French nation to the people of America. It's a thank you for all the people they took in who'd fled persecution and war, and sometimes famine. And when that statue was going up, Emma Lazarus wrote this. Not like the brazen giant of Greek fame with conquering limbs astride from land to land, here at our sea-washed sunset gates shall stand a mighty woman with a torch whose flame is imprisoned lightning and her name, Mother of Exiles. From her beacon hand glows worldwide welcome. Her mild eyes command the air-bridged harbour that twin cities frame. Keep, ancient lands, your story pomp, cries she with silent lips. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. The wretched refuse of your teeming shore, send these the homeless tempest toss to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. And I suppose the challenge for me is, uh, are we more like Emma Lazarus and those she wrote about uh, of her own country welcoming others? Are we like these folk who didn't like what Bartimaeus was saying? How much they wanted him to stop. But Jesus was having none of it. Bring him to me, he says, and his attitude hasn't changed. But then as he got to Jerusalem, there were yet more people. People who made promises with their lips and with the palm branches and their cloaks that they wouldn't keep. Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a colt uh, because 
He didn't want to come in as a conquering hero. People wanted him to be that, to throw the Romans out. But no, he came a young donkey to say, I come in peace. He wasn't there to conquer, but to suffer and to die. And to change our lives forever. Oh, they were having a great time and it was a great day and uh, great things were happening as far as they were concerned. Well, uh, that's unless you owned palm trees. Um, uh, when we moved into Shubriness, uh, which is part of the South End, um, we, um, we took a trip down the seafront and, and uh, James, one of uh, Ruth's son, came to see us and uh, we took him down to show him the seafront and the wonders of South End. We said, we've even got palm trees. And... As we drove along, he said, well, they're poor examples of palm trees, aren't they? I mean, they were nice and straight and tall, but they had about three tufts at the top. The wind and the weather in South End uh, had not been kind to some of the palm trees. And I've always imagined, uh, since seeing those and since James' comment, that that's how the palm trees looked after Jesus had been passed that day. The people were excited. Oh, it was great. It was wonderful. What a time to be alive. The rush of the moment caught them up in the fervor and, and, and they were all swept before it. They would have promised anything. They shouted, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. They acknowledged him as the Messiah. Everything was going to be okay. All was going to be fine. Everything would be good. And then a week later, as he's taken and judged and put to the cross, the crowds beforehand shouted, crucify him, crucify him, and mocked him as he hung on the cross. It's easy, isn't it, in the rush of the moment to promise anything, to say anything. But when trouble comes, when difficulty comes, that shows the true measure of our trust in God. It's so easy to be caught up in a fervour. Perhaps when we go somewhere where there's lots of Christians together, all worshipping God, and the singing is wonderful, and uh, the preaching is better than you normally get on a Sunday. And it's just great. But what about the Monday morning? As we walk down the road and we meet that person and we think, oh, if I talk to her, if I talk to him, it's going to be a good 20 minutes at least. And I've got places to go and things to do. And yet, like Bartimaeus, they long to know something different than they know. Or perhaps for us who follow him, as life gets tough, which it does, and things go wrong, which they do, and our souls and our minds and our hearts feel cold and empty. It happens. It always has, and it, it always will. Um, one of John Newton's um, co-hymn writers, or John Newton's co-hymn writer, William Cooper, lived um, not far from him in a place called Oney, and uh, Newton was often called out in the middle of the night because his friend was in despair. In despair that God didn't love him. In despair that he'd sinned in a way that he could lose his salvation. In despair. And yet one of the, and one of the verses of one of the hymns that William Cooper wrote is, Where is the blessedness I knew when first I saw the Lord? Where is the soul refreshing view of Jesus and his word? And just like Cooper needed John Newton, we need each other. We need each other. I went to the coffee morning yesterday um, at uh, uh, Market Bosworth, that's the place. <laughs> yeah, I've only been here six months. Um, and uh, the, the church at Market Bosworth was, was, was running. It was great. It was, it was buzzing and there was cake and scones everywhere. And I managed to be good and not have a single bit of cake. Or a scone. I know you're impressed, aren't you? Anyway, I asked someone that I know, uh, who's a relative of, of someone who comes to the church there. I asked someone, you know, how are you? 
And um, they told me their woes. And, you know, listen, and to be honest, it's been awful. Um, the things that have been going on. And at the end of it, he said to me, but you didn't want to hear all that, did you? And I said, no, that's okay. You needed to tell someone, didn't you? And he said, yeah, I did. I needed to tell someone. Sometimes people just need to tell someone. Sometimes people need us to hear them like Jesus heard Bartimaeus. Sometimes you need to be heard like Jesus heard Bartimaeus. When you're in trouble, tell someone about it. Oh, don't, don't get me wrong. There will be people who won't listen. <laughs> there will be people who don't understand. There will be people who maybe cross the road the next time they meet you in the street because they don't want to be slowed down. But there will be people who listen. And I pray that we are people who listen. People who not just worship God in the good times, in the times when we're all together, when it's easy, when the singing is good and the fellowship is great and the people are lovely, but also in the hard times. Allow people to be there for us and be there for others. For Jesus is always there for us. He was there for Bartimaeus even when people found him to be an inconvenience. He was there for those people who thought it was glorious and then shouted, crucify him, crucify him. But as far as this story is concerned, I think we begin by being just like Bartimaeus. <laughs>